God has shown us through the, through the observance of his feast days, his incredible plan for the reconciliation of mankind to himself. Now, due to the fact that sin entered into the world through one man, we find that in Romans chapter 5 and verse 12, and the consequences of sin, God has established various stages by which his plan would come to fruition. Those who have been given the, the opportunity to be a part of the early harvest, if successful, God's, God's, God's requirement will be given the privilege to be laborers in the great abundant harvest that we are picturing at this time. Now, as we covered, as we covered last time, God expects his uh, laborers, his workers, God expects everyone, each and every one of us to be certain uh, qualities. We must, we must love mercy or we must have godly c compassion. We must have that spirit of joy and that spirit should show forth and should manifest itself in praise. So th these are just some of the things that God has shown us. These we must show These we must <laughs> Okay. Now as I just stated God has shown us that we must bear the, the fruit, that we must love mercy, that we, that we must bear the fruit of, of joy. That is, we must show praise and thanksgiving to our God. Now, these are the things that God is looking for in us to show that we are indeed have a relationship with the Lord of the harvest, who is God the Father, the Father, and Jesus Christ, who is the overseer of that harvest. So let's now continue our, ex our examination of the qualities God is looking for, for those who will be work, laborers in his great harvest. Let's begin with Psalm 1, 113. Psalm 113. Now, we, we started... We read this psalm the last time, and we started in verse 1, where we, where we talked about this psalm is addressed to the servants of God. And we all know who the servants of God are. This psalm is addressed to the servants of God. But let's start with verse 4, Psalm 113 and verse 4. The eternal is high above all nations, his glory above the above the heavens. And then they ask the question, who is like unto the eternal our God who dwells on high? And, and Isaiah adds, who inhabits eternity? So who is like unto this great God, the question asks, who dwells on high, who humbled himself, himself to behold the things that are in heavens and in the earth? Now, here, here we see the servants of God praising him, standing in awe of this great God, and ask the question, who is like the eternal of God? That, of course, is a, is a rhetorical question, 
because there is none. The same question was asked by ancient Israel as they jubilantly sang the song of Moses, celebrating their redemption from Egypt. Let's notice this back in, uh, keep your place in Psalm. Let's notice this back in, back in Exodus chapter 15 and verse one. Exodus 15 and verse one. Here in, uh, sorry, Exodus 15 and verse 11. Picking it up in the middle of the song. And the question again, who is, who is like you among the gods or eternal? Who is like you? So here we see twice they ask the question, who is like you? Who is like you? Majestic in holiness, awesome in praises, working wonders. Brethren, the greatest, the greatness and majesty of God is simply unparalleled. He is so high that as it says here, he's above all nations and his glory above the very heavens which he created. He is so high that none can be compared to, to him. None can equal, be equal to him. But yet, notice in this, these verses, we're back in Psalm 113, Notice in this, this verse what it says about the God's nature that from a human perspective does not go together. Doesn't make sense. And what that is, is greatness and majesty. Again, verse six, who humbled himself to behold the things that are in the heavens and in the earth. Again, when we think of greatness and majesty, humility, that is not the first thing that comes to mind as human beings. And naturally, our reasoning does not go there. But one of the most incredible characteristics of God, who is above all heavens, who dwells on high, is that he's a God who humbles himself to behold the things that are in heaven and in the earth. Now the righteous angels who are in heaven are at the very presence of God's throne. They see this face to face, they understand this. They can see the glory and majesty of God. They see and fully understand, they see and fully understand this. This is why we find that they were always praising God. Let's notice in, in, in Revelation chapter 4 and verse 8. Revelation chapter 4 and verse 8 states, The four living creatures, each having six wings, were full of eyes around and within. And they do not rest day or night, saying, Holy, 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 Lord God Almighty, who was and is and is to come. Whenever the living creatures give glory and honor and thanks to him who sits on the throne, who lives forever and ever, the 24 elders fall down before him who sits on the throne and worship him, who and worship him who lives forever and ever, and cast their thrones before the throne, saying, here is what they say, you are worthy, O Lord, to receive glory and honor and power, for you created all things, and by your will, know that, brethren, by your will they exist. So everything in this entire universe exists simply because of the will of God. By your will, it says, they exist and were created. Now, we remember that these, that these angels are ministering spirits. They understand and they are delighted to have been given the privilege to be in God's presence and also to serve God. 
in Hebrews 1 and verse 14, you don't have to turn there, but it says, are they not all ministering spirits sent out to serve for the sake of those who are inherit salvation? Ministering spirits sent out to serve those who are to inherit salvation. Who is it talking about here? It's talking about those whom God is working with now. In Revelation, in Revelation 7, that's a few, if you're still in Revelation, in, in Revelation 7 and verse 11, Revelation 7 and verse 11, all the angels stood around the throne and the elders and the four living creatures and fell on their faces before the throne and worshiped God, saying, Amen blessing and glory and wisdom, thanksgiving and honor and power and might be to our God forever and ever, amen. So brethren, we see here that God not only humbles himself to behold the things that are in heaven, but also the things that are on earth also. So one of the vital, one of the vital, <laughs> lessons we must learn is that God and no one else is the one who sets the standards. We can't look to anybody else to set the standard. It is God who sets the standard. And as Jesus Christ told his disciples, we are to become perfect even as our heavenly father is perfect. So then, since the most high God and the word humble themselves to behold their, their creation, then the unmistakable conclusion we must come to is that a humble spirit is part and parcel of God's nature. There is no other conclusion that we can come to. Humility is not something that God has to put on. It is part and parcel of his mindset. Think of it, brethren. There is no other, there is none other higher than God and Jesus Christ. Christ has been given all authority in heaven and earth, but yet, yet we find as the, these two great beings desire to have a close relationship with those made in their image and likeness. What closer can there be to be children of God? What closer relationship can we be to, be to be very children of the great God? Now, the, this very nature of God was strikingly demonstrated by the life of the one who became Jesus Christ. Let's notice this in Matthew chapter 11 and verse 27. Matthew chapter 11 and verse 27. I'm going to read this from the Phillips translation because it brings, out, it brings it out in a forceful manner. Then he said, everything has been put into my hands by my father. You can't get a clearer statement than that. Everything has been put into my hands by my Father. And we also, we can read the same thing in, in Matthew 28, verse 18, where he says, all authority is given, has been given to me. Continuing in verse 11, in verse 27. And nobody, nobody knows the Son except the Father. Nor does anyone know the Father except the Son and the man to whom the son choose, chooses to reveal him. Verse 28, come to me, Jesus is telling us, come to me all you who are weary and overburdened and I will give you rest. Put on my yoke upon, put on my yoke and learn from me. For I am gentle 
read in the King James, I am meek, or I am gentle or meek and humble in heart, and you will find rest for your souls or for your minds. Now let's take careful note, brethren, of what Christ is saying here. The Lord of the harvest, the Father, has given him total, total control over his, that is the Father's harvest. Now, again, the human mind finds it hard to come to grips with the reality of one who is meek and humble, and also one who has been given, a, and one who can claim authority over everything that has been entrusted to him by the Father. You know, it's, it, doesn't, it doesn't compute because of what we are used to, because of what we see all around us. The one who has all power, all might, the one who is given all authority says, as it says in verse 29, for I am gentle or meek and humble in heart. This is the one who became our savior. Yet, as we see here, brethren, in spite of all that has been given to Christ in the spirit of humility, his desire is to take care of all who are weary and overburdened. Now the question we need to ask ourselves in is, what human being in the history of man has not become weary and overburdened by sin? Absolutely no one. That, that again, is a, is, a, is, a, is a rhetorical question because the answer is obvious. Everyone has become weary and overburdened with sin and all the consequences of sin. And that weariness and overburden is becoming more and more as that pressure continue to increase. But note, brethren, that, that Christ, that Jesus Christ, did not invite us in a condescending in a condescending way, unlike other human beings. You know, I got the power, so you come and, and grovel at my feet, and maybe I'll throw you a scrap or two. No, Christ does not invite us that way. We are invited to come to Him, to come to Him. Now it's ironic that the being God created with the most talents and abilities, became so focused on self that he could not recognize the spirit of humility in the most high God and the word. I mean, this being was brilliant. We heard from the sermon yesterday from Ezekiel. This be being was brilliant, but yet he could not recognize the spirit of humility in the Most High God and, and Jesus Christ and the Word, the one who became Jesus Christ. So what we are talking about then is about the mind of Jesus Christ. Now, in addition to the words of Jesus Christ himself, the Apostle Paul gives us a powerful description of the way that mind works, the way the mind of Christ works. So let's listen. Let's take a look at the way it works. In Philippians chapter 2. This is the way Christ's mind operates. Philippians chapter 2. Again, this was read earlier. Philippians chapter 2 and verse 6. I'm going to read this from the complete, complete Jewish Bible. Verse, chapter 2 and verse 6 states, Though he was in the form of God, he did not regard equality with God something to be possessed by force. On the contrary, he emptied himself in that he took the form of a slave by becoming like human beings are. And when he appeared as a human being, note this again, he humbled himself still more by becoming obedient even to death, death on the stake as a criminal. There can be no vivid 
demonstration of what humility is all about than what Jesus Christ did. Jesus Christ graphically demonstrated to us what the standard for godly humility is, what it's all about. God the Father did not humble Jesus Christ because that was already a part of his nature. And as Paul writes here, he humbled himself, or in the, use this translation, he emptied himself. He humbled himself. He emptied himself of the, of the glory that he had with the Father to become just as human as the first man that he made of the dust of the ground. That is what Jesus Christ did. But then, if that wasn't enough, note what it says again. He humbled himself still more by becoming obedient to, to death. Now, it wasn't enough to Christ, for Christ to become a human being, live his life, preach the gospel, and then, you know, suffer a, a, a quick and painless death. It wasn't enough as far as God is concerned. He humbled himself still more by becoming obedient unto death. Not just any death. It says here, death on a stake as a criminal. As a common criminal. Brethren, if we could just grasp a little tiny smidgen, if we could just grasp a little bit this stupendous act of self-abasement of our Savior, then we can understand why this quality is so absolutely vital. This quality is not a part of the nature we were all born with. Absolutely not. Instead, we have the pride of life we inherited as an integral part of our human nature. It's in our DNA, so to speak. So those who have been given the opportunity so those who have been given an opportunity to have a relationship with God have also been given the incredible privilege to be able to share this his very nature. That is God's nature. To be a laborer in God's harvest, brethren, this quality, as all the other qualities that we've reviewed so far, is critical. It is absolutely indispensable. Please turn with me to 2 Peter, 2 Peter chapter 1 and verse 1. Peter brings up something here. 2 Peter, 2 Peter chapter 1 and verse 1. Simon Peter, a bondservant and apostle of Jesus Christ, to those who have obtained like precious faith with us, by the righteousness of our God and Savior, Jesus Christ, grace and peace be multiplied to you in, or better, by the full knowledge. The, that is the, that word for, for knowledge there is epinosis, which means full, fuller, not just knowledge. It means the full, deep knowledge of God and, and, and of Jesus Christ and of Jesus our Lord. Verse three, as his divine power has given us all things that pertain to life and godliness, through the knowledge of him who called us by glory and virtue, by which have been given to us exceedingly great and precious promises, that through these we may be partakers, note this brethren, that through these we may be partakers or sharers. God has made us incredible, great, and precious promises. These promises enable us to be partakers or sharers of this divine nature, having escaped the corruption that is in the world through lust. So we see here that divine nature Humility is part and parcel of that divine nature. Now, there are a lot of things that we can say about, about humility. And of course, we heard some of that yesterday. 
But the greatest and most concentrated lesson that we can learn is by listening to the voice of the master, the teacher, the overseer of God's harvest. And we're going to listen to what he says as he speaks about his relationship to the Father. So let's listen carefully then to the voice of a perfect mind expressing that perfect submission. John chapter 5. John chapter 5. And verse, verse 19. John chapter 5, verse, verse 19. Then Jesus answered and said unto them, Most assuredly. Now, it, it depends on what translation you read that those, uh, what it, those two words are translated as. Some, some says verily, verily, and most assuredly, or whatever. But to get the full impact of what Jesus Christ is saying here, it can be translated, I am telling you the solemn truth. Now, here's the God of all truth, the God who, who is truth, telling his disciples, look, I am telling you the solemn truth. How important is this? I am telling you the solemn truth. The son can do nothing of himself, but what he sees the father do. For whatever he does, the son does in like manner. Dropping down to verse 30, Christ says, I can of myself do nothing. As I hear, I judge, and my judgment is righteous, because I do not seek my own will but the will of the Father who sent me. Now, we may intellectually understand what Christ is saying here. We understand the words. They are not difficult to comprehend. But the question is, do we show our, in our daily lives that we really believe what Christ is saying here? Do we show, brethren, in our daily lives that we really believe and understand what Jesus Christ is saying here. Now, furthermore, do we, as Christ's disciples, really believe him when he told us, back in John, you don't have to turn there, when he told us, without me, you can do nothing. So Jesus said, in relationship, as he walked this earth, I of my own self can do nothing. He tells us, again, later in the same book, without me, you can do nothing. Now, again, do we really comprehend what that means? Can we really appreciate the gravity of, of what that means for us? Now, when Jesus said that of himself he can do nothing, what does that really mean? He meant that not only was he totally, not only was he totally dependent on the Father for sustenance, physically and spiritually, but more than that, over and by himself he could do nothing of any value or meaning. Nothing of any value or meaning. This was a statement, brethren, of the one who emptied himself, as we just read. The one who emptied himself of his divinity. Now, if we, human beings, who are nothing, as it says in Isaiah 40, and not only are we nothing, we are less than nothing, then how much more can we do of ourselves? How much more can we really do of ourselves? One thing we know for sure, brethren, of ourselves, of and by ourselves, we have no problem sinning and creating chaos and confusion. But there's absolutely no value to that. Zero. 
There's absolutely zero value to that. So we can do something on ourselves okay, but there's absolutely no value to it there, none. So the question is, where does that leave us? If Christ said he couldn't do nothing, and if we, Christ tells us without him we can do nothing, so where does that leave us? Again, we remember what we just read in Matthew 11. Christ says to learn from him, to learn from him. This means we are to learn the way his mind operates. We can do this because God has given us a record in scripture of how he thinks. And he has given us a spirit of, he has given us a spirit of a sound mind so that we can learn from him. Now as disciples, we are students. We are learners. And as the saying goes, learning is not compulsory. Neither is survival. So God doesn't force us to learn. Christ says to learn from him. We have an option. But the reality is, brethren, it's not compulsory. Neither is survival. So, we, we are disciples, we are learners. We are in training now to become laborers in God's great harvest. God has to show us how to do everything of any value. So unless more of Christ's thoughts become our thoughts, and more of his ways become our ways, it is simply impossible for us to develop the quality of godly humility. Simply impossible. Let's notice what the Apostle Paul says back in Philippians. We were there earlier. Philippians chapter 2 and verse 5. Philippians 2 and verse 5, Paul writes, Let this mind, this mind be in you, which was also in Christ Jesus. We cannot have the mind of Christ unless we have his spirit. Nor can we understand Christ's teaching apart from his spirit. God gives us the spirit of Christ. And utilizing that spirit, we must develop the mind of Christ. Each and every one of us, brethren, it's our responsibility to develop the mind of Christ. God doesn't do it for us. He gives us the tools that we need, but we have to develop the mind of Christ, utilizing the spirit that he has given us. For the mind of Christ, then, to be in us, we must come to intimately know the way his mind operates. The mind of Christ works the same way as the mind of the Father. It operates the exact same way. Because we read in scripture that Christ says, I and my Father are one. I and my Father are one. Now, what this means in reality is that when Christ does something or says something, he automatically knows that the Father is in total agreement. Everything Christ says and does, he, have to, he doesn't have to say, is my Father going to agree with this? No. He automatically knows that the Father is in total agreement with everything that he says. So our goal then is to always be at one with Christ and the Father. As indeed Christ prayed during that, during that night, in John 17, you don't have to turn there, Christ prayed that they may be one as you, Father, are in me and I in you, that they may be one in us. That's from John 17 and verse 11. John 17 and verse 11. 
So we have already seen in graphic detail the way Christ's mind works. As we read in, in Philippians, he emptied himself. And if that wasn't enough, he humbled himself still more. Let's turn over to, to Matthew chapter 7. And look at a statement Christ makes as he's winding down his teachings, his discourse to his disciples. In Matthew 7 and verse 17, Matthew 7 and verse 17, even so, every good tree bears good fruit, but a bad tree bears bad fruit. A good tree cannot bear bad fruit, nor can a bad tree bears good fruit. Now, I'll give you a simple example. When was the last time you went to pick grapes from a thorn bush? Or when was the last time you went to pick figs from thistles? As, as Christ brings out here in verse 17. I mean, that seems like a rather absurd question to even say that. But the reality, brethren, what Jesus Christ in, is, in bringing out, is bringing to our attention, what he's bringing to our attention here is that those of us who are in training to be laborers in his great harvest, we need to pay attention to these things. Because here's the principle. If the root stock is not of the right type, then the resulting tree will be a bad tree. This guaranteed. It's guaranteed to happen. If the root stock is not of the right type, the resulting tree will be a bad tree. So the principle is then, at the root, at the root of every good tree bearing good fruit is humility. If you dig down to that good tree, you'll find at its, at its rootstock humility. On the contrary, at the root of every bad tree bearing bad fruit is pride. Now, it's easy for us to think that we humble ourselves before God. But the test of whether our humility is genuine or not whether it is real or not, is our humility towards men. Now, how do I say that? This is based on the principle the Apostle John brings out in 1 John 4. Let's, let's turn there and look at what the Apostle John writes to us. 1 John 4 and verse 20. If someone says, I love God and hates his brother, he is a liar. For he who does not love his brother whom he has seen, how can he love God whom he has not seen? There is no way anyone can reason around this plain statement. This statement is pretty plain. You can't not subject to interpretation. Of course, the carnal mind can always put its own spin on things. Our love for God, brethren, our love for God is demonstrated by your interactions with other human beings. Moreover, when whatever love we have for God will be a, a delusion unless except as is it except as it is able to withstand the, the test of our daily life with our fellow men this is in effect what the apostle john is saying in the same manner humility before god is nothing if not proved in humility before men you can't have one without the other. 
It's like saying you're going to take the two great laws on which everything hangs on and separate them. Will not happen. So the way we use our minds determine whether or not we will develop godly humility. One of the essential keys we must use for developing the mind of Christ is brought out by Paul in the same section that we read earlier. So let's go back again to Philippians. Philippians chapter 2 and verse 3. Philippians chapter 2 and verse 3. This is New American Standard translation. Do nothing from selfishness, from selfishness or empty conceit, but with humility of mind, regard one another as more important than yourself. The English Standard Version puts that a little bit different, but essentially the same. It says, in humility, in humility, count others more significant than yourself. Verse 4, do not merely look out for your own personal interests, but also for the interests of others. This vital key the Apostle Paul g g gives us here is too often neglected in our lives, or at best, it is given lip service. And no wonder, because it is one of the most difficult things to do. It goes against the grain of the nature we all have, which is self. It just goes against the grain. It simply doesn't come naturally. Selfishness and humility are mutually exclusive. What that means is that they cannot operate in the same space in our mind. They cannot occupy the same space in our mind. Jesus Christ, of course, was totally selfless. Selfishness and humility cannot operate in the same space in our mind. So Paul here shows the type of mindset that is incompatible with that of a true Christian. Christians should always seek the approval of God, not the applause of men. Humility of mind manifests, in, manifests itself in self-forgetfulness, in serving others. The spirit, again, which resembles that of Jesus Christ. This Christ-like spirit of humility fixes its, its eyes on the excellency of others and judges them from that standpoint. Now, we know back in Matthew chapter 7, Christ says, you know, do not judge. And it's very easy to look at the twig in our brother's eye, but it yet ignore the log that's in our own eyes. This is what Christ admonishes us. Let's notice again back in 1 Peter. Let's turn back to 1 Peter. 1 Peter chapter 5. And you may want to mark this area, this, this, this section, because we're going to go back and forth from this a lot. 1 Peter chapter 5 and verse 5. This is from the English Standard Version translation. 1 Peter 5 and verse 5. Likewise, you who are younger... Be subject to the elders. And note what he says here. Clothe yourself, all of you, with humility. It doesn't matter whether you're younger or it doesn't matter when you're older. Peter writes here, clothe yourselves, all of you, with humility towards one another. For God opposes the proud but gives grace to the humble. Humble yourself, therefore, under the mighty hand of God, so that at the proper time he may exalt you, casting all your cares or anxieties on him, 
because he cares for you. Now, when we see the term here, clothe yourself or be clothed with, with humility, the first thing that comes to mind is that it's something that we put on on the outside. You know, when you said put clothes on, obviously it's something that we can see on the outside. But the word that Peter here uses for humility is a compound term of humility and mind. Humility and mind. So what we're seeing here, what we're talking about here is not something that, that can be seen from the outside necessarily. Humility and mind. Now, there are acts of humility one can perform. But more importantly, brethren, there is a mindset. One can perform outward acts of humility, yet in God's eyes, what he sees is a proud spirit. So we can pretend, or we can be, think we have to be sincere, but if it's just an outward act, it goes against God. Now, the word translated that Peter uses here, clothe yourself or clothe, it means to fasten or gird oneself. The article of clothing that Peter is referring here to is a slave's apron that they use to serve their master. Now, why is this important? This is important because on the night of the Passover, Jesus Christ girded himself with the slave's apron and washed the disciples' feet, as we read in John 13 and verse 4. John 13 and verse 4 states, he rose, from, he rose up from supper, laid aside his garments, and he took a towel and girded himself. And of course, Jesus then washed all 12 disciples' feet, including Judas, the one who would betray him. Think about it, brethren. Jesus washed the feet of Judas, whom he knew was going to betray him in a, in a few hours from the time that he did this act. So Peter here, he, he's remembering all these things. Peter, is call, is, Peter calls to mind the teaching of Jesus Christ that says that the servant is not above his master. And also what Jesus Christ told them that night. I have given you an example that you should do as I have done to you. Peter had seen true humility and now he calls on believers to emulate Christ. And just as Paul, and just as Paul showed that Jesus humbled himself, as we read earlier, Peter now brings out, brings, brings out the fact that we must also humble ourselves in order to be the continual recipient of God's gracious favor. And something we need to consider about this mindset is that humility is the preparation for service. And service is the test of humility. The two, are, the two interplay with each other. Humility is the preparation of service. And service is the test of humility. Now, in verse 6, uh, back, in, um, back in 1 Peter, 1 Peter 5 and verse 6, we see that Peter urges Christians to humble themselves. But notice he adds something here. He adds, under the mighty hand of God. Peter adds this because humility requires it absolutely requires that we always have a proper perspective of who God is and who we are. 
Now, as we know, Abraham, a servant of God, he was a servant and a friend of God. He understood exactly where he stood in relation to the word. Because we read back in, back in Genesis chapter 18, you don't have to turn there. Remember when he pleaded with, with the word, with God, to save the, the, those who were righteous, if you could find them, in Sodom. So Genesis 18 and verse 27, here's, here's what Abraham, Abraham said. Then, then Abraham answered and said, Indeed, notice how he begins this. I who am but dust and ashes. He understood he, where he was in relationship to God. I who am but dust and ashes have taken it upon myself to speak to the Lord. Suppose there were five, suppose there were five less than 50, 50 righteous. Would you destroy all of the city for lack of five? So he said, this is what God said, if I find there are 45, I will not destroy it. But again, our focus, notice the focus of Abraham. I am but dust and ashes. You see the, the respect that he had for the great God. Now, Job, another servant of God, he came for a very painful but enlightened understanding of exactly where he stood in relation to God. After he could not resist the all-out attack on his mind from the one who is king over all the children of pride. Notice in Job 45, 42 and verse 5. Job 42 and verse 5. Job said, I have heard of you by the hearing of the ear, but now my eye sees you. Therefore, I abhor myself and repent in dust and ashes. So after God opened Job's eyes, no longer did he, did he even remotely consider himself to be God's equal. Just as, just as Job had to change the way he used his mind. How do, you, how do we know that? Repent. Repent. Repent means we have to change the way we use our minds. Job says, I repent in dust and ashes. So just as Job had to change the way he used his mind, so must we. Job had to repent of all that is at the root of sin, which is pride. At the root of all sin is pride. Now, back in verse, 1 Peter, again, verse 5. 1 Peter, again, verse 5. In verse 7, Peter also brings out an aspect of, of humility that we need to consider, brethren. Now, humility manifests itself in handing over our worries to God. So, in effect then, worry is a form of pride. Now, how can I say that? Worry is a form of pride because it denies the care of the Almighty God. Now, Peter makes an unqualified statement again, back in 1 Peter 5 and verse 7. Peter makes an unqualified statement. He cares for you. God cares for us. If we really believe God cares for us then, we will stop worrying and put our trust in him. But we find it so hard to let go, don't we? We find it so hard to let go of our worries. Let me read verse seven from the Phillips translation because it brings it out in a more forceful way. Again, 1 Peter 5 and verse seven. Philip's rendering, you can throw 
the whole weight of your anxieties upon him, for you are his personal concern. Consider that, brethren. Consider what Peter is saying here. You control your whole, the whole weight of your anxieties, for you are his personal concern. So then, if we find ourselves being weighed down with worries, consider, do we believe what God says, that he cares for us? It's, again, it's not an easy thing to do. It's not an easy thing to do. But we have to ask God to help us to understand the reality of what his scripture is telling us. So the antidote to worrying is believing in and resting in God's care. Again, you can go back to, to Matthew chapter 6 where Christ admonished his disciples, don't worry about you know, what you put on and so on and so forth. And also, we can turn to Matthew. We're not going to turn there, but you can look at that where it says in Matthew 7 and verse 7, it says, ask. Ask. We have to ask. If we don't, if we don't ask, well, you, you can answer that question. You can finish that for yourself. If you don't ask, what's going to happen? Keep your, keep your place in 1 Peter. Let's look at Psalm 55 and verse 2, 22. Turn over to Psalm 55 and verse 22. Psalm 55 and verse 22 states, Cast your burden. Now, the, word, the Hebrew word translated burden is Whatever is given you, or your appointed lot. So there's a wide variety of burdens that we can have. But it states here, unequivocally, cast your burden on the eternal, and he will sustain you. He shall never permit the righteous to be moved. Now, if, if you can picture in your mind a uh, uh, hurricane, a big gust of wind, and you have a tree that's firmly rooted. We've seen pictures of this, and you can see how the tree bends. It bends, but it doesn't break. It bends. I mean, it doesn't. So th th this is what, th this is the effect of what he's saying here. He's not going to permit the righteous to be moved. Now, there is one thing that we have to take note, is, note here is that is the word righteous, okay? Because if you do, it says, when you cast your burden on God, you better make sure that you are seeking righteousness and not trying to work out your own salvation in a wrong manner without the proper fear of God. He says he will never permit the righteous to be moved. Now, it doesn't mean that the righteous aren't going to be blown here or blown there, but as long as you are righteous, as long as your feet are firmly placed, and we're going to come to that in a, in a, in a few minutes, God is not going to permit you to be, to be moved. So having a humble, humble attitude before God and putting all our cares into his hands, it is critical for the true believer. Absolutely critical. Surrendering control of our lives to God must be an active, not passive submission. Brethren, we must actively surrender our lives to God. It's something we must do with our minds, with our eyes wide open. It requires, as we just read, walking righteously. It requires, as we just read, as we read earlier what Jesus Christ said, 
not my will. Well, he said, your will, he came to do his will, but it, it, Christ says, as he faced those last few moments, those last harrowing moments as he was about to suffer, he said, not my will, but yours. Let's stop for a minute and consider something, brethren. As we are now observing the last day of the Feast of Tabernacles, let's consider the impact of the absence of a humble spirit we'll have during these very times. This last day symbolizes the end of the 1,000 years. And according to the word of God, something very drastic is going to happen when this day comes to an end. Please turn with me over to Revelation 20 and verse 7. Revelation 20, verse 7. This is what's going to happen when this day comes to an end, as we are symbolizing right now. Revelation 20, verse 7. Now when the thousand years have expired, Satan will be released from his prison and will go out to deceive the nations which are in the four corners of the earth, Gog and Magog, to gather them together to battle, whose number is as the sand of the sea. Note that. This is not just a few straggling dozens. Their number, it says, is as the sand of the sea. They went up on the breadth of the earth and surrounded the camp of the saints and the beloved city. And fire came down from God out of heaven and devoured them. The question we might ask ourselves is, why on earth? Why on earth with all these people living under perfect conditions, with a perfect government, rise up in rebellion against God? Why? God will have made sure that everyone will have sufficient time to get to know him by being taught by perfect teachers. These are the laborers in the harvest that we are in training for. Why? What, what we see here, brethren, what we see here is in effect a replay of what happened aeons ago, when a created being became full of pride and instigated a rebellion against God. Now, there's one thing we must understand. There is no guarantee that people with independent minds, independent free will, living on the perfect conditions and perfect government will wing willingly submit their minds to God. There is no guarantee, none. And this is what we see here. No amount of peer pressure no amount of peer pressure can cause anyone to humble themselves if they do not desire to. There may be outward conformance, as indeed there will be. There, there will not be any crime. Remember, this is the way, walk in it. God isn't going to tolerate lawlessness. God isn't going to tolerate demonstrations. So outwardly, there will be conformance. But inwardly, we see the fruits of it right here. God shows us. Inwardly, there is resistance. The people who rebel against God at the end of the 1,000 years will never have really repented. And because of that, humility never took root in their minds. Think about it. Why would you want to go up against God after living on all these perfect conditions? Why? Again, this is what pride does. 
And the reality is, brethren, without true repentance, there can be no true humility. Without true repentance, and I emphasize the word true, without true repentance, there can be no true humility. So when God allows Satan to broadcast for a short time, the devil will find receptive minds. This will be God's means of bringing rebellion out into the open. God will make it manifest. God will make it plain that these people want no part of surrendering themselves to God. The lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, and the pride of life will not have been overcome. All the outward compliance did not bring about an inward renewed mind leading to conversion. And what we must understand, brethren, is that resentful or passive obedience is a form of rebellion. God wants active submission, active obedience. Not just going along because of whatever, because if I don't, I'm going to get smacked in the head. God wants active obedience, not passive obedience. But we have to deal with the devil now. We have to deal with the devil now. And this being does not want us to qualify to be workers in God's harvest. So God inspired Peter to give us critically important information on what we must be doing as we undergo our training process. Let's go back to 1 Peter. 1 Peter chapter 5. 1 Peter chapter 5 and verse 8. 1 Peter chapter 5 and verse 8. This is from the English Standard Version again. 1 Peter chapter 5. Peter writes, be sober-minded. Now, this is the third time in this letter Peter is using the exact same phrase. You can jot down the other places in chapter 1 and verse 13 and chapter 4 and verse 7 of 1 Peter. Pretty much the same thing. Be sober-minded. Be watchful. I mean, Peter is essentially repeating the lessons that Jesus Christ gave them. I mean, he learned. He learned the hard way, too. So Peter is just giving us what he learned from Jesus Christ. Be sober-minded. Be watchful. Your adversary, the devil, prowls around like a roaring lion, seeking someone to devour. So here Peter draws on parables Jesus gave about the household, householder and the burglar. And you can go back in Matthew 24 around verse 42 onwards and read these. You know, that the householder, if he was watching, he wouldn't have allowed the burglar to come in. So these, these are the things, the importance of watching. Be sober-minded. And, and also there's a parable about the the faithful and the wise servant, and the evil servant. The faithful servant is going to be busy watching, doing what God tells him to do. The evil servant is going to say, nah, my Lord delays his coming, and so on. And he begins to not only say that, he begins to smite his fellow servants. So Peter is, is bringing out these, these things to our attention. Now, we've had a graphic demonstration in our time of how quickly events can happen around the world that can throw us in a loop if, if we are not watching, if we are not being sober-minded and watchful. Our adversary, the Diablos, 
is walking around the earth seeking to devour victims. You know who those victims are? God's people, members of the body of Jesus Christ. This is the ones, they are the ones who has this target in his mind on their backs. So he's walking around seeking to devour victims. Now, Satan's tactics has not changed from the time of Job and even before that. You know, he doesn't change. He, he looks at the same playbook over and over and over. He just shifted variation and so on. Let's notice quickly in Job chapter 1 and verse 7. Job chapter 1 and verse 7. God brings something to our attention here. Job 1 and verse 7. And the Eternal said to Satan, From where do you come? So Satan answered the Eternal and said, From going to and fro on the earth and walking back and forth on it. So the question is, what is Satan looking for when he is seeking to devour someone? Satan knows that God had says, set hedges around his people, as we can read in, in, verse, in chapter 1 and, and verse 10 of Job. God has set hedges around his people. So what he is looking for is how he can influence the minds. How he can influence our minds. Now, only God can discern the thoughts and intentions of our heart. We read that back in Hebrews chapter 4 and verse 12. Only God can do that. Satan can't do that. Satan can't read our minds. But what Satan does, he watches, watches us carefully, closely, to see what the outcome of all those thoughts and intents are. For instance, he can see when someone is getting angry about something, like being caught off in traffic. We all have faced this from one time to another. Now, he can see our reaction to that. He can see the temperature rising, the temperature rising. So what does he do? As the prince of the power of the air, he can, in, he can attempt to inject his angry spirit to add fuel to the fire, you may see. So as you see us getting angry, he takes advantage of that. He wants to add fuel to the fire, and soon you have a raging inferno. That is the way Satan does. Now, back in 1 Peter again, but Peter here, Peter highlights critical information about Satan that we must understand. This is the critical information that, that, that Peter brings to our attention here. He focuses our attention not on the lion's strength, but on the lion's roar. The lion's roar, a roaring lion. Now, the lion's roar is intended to, in, to intimidate victims. But the lion's roar never kills. Now, in one sense it can if some people are killed by fright, so to speak. But really, it's, it's more psychological, it's more mental. When you hear the roar of a lion, now, if, 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 you were, if you were standing outside of a door and you hear the roar of a lion coming from the other side of the door, it will strike fear in you. But if you opened that door and saw that the lion was all caged up, 
with bars that he could not possibly break, then what's the big deal? But, it, but humans, humanly speaking, it is a big deal when we hear the lion's roar. Because the lion's roar is intended to intimidate us. It is intended to fight, to strike fear in his victims. Now fear paralyzes. Fear causes people to do irrational things. All what we have to do is look around us today. Fear, caused by the roar of the lion. By instilling fear in his victims, his desire is to install his thoughts, his way of thinking into our minds to have a wrong reaction. His desire is to make us more receptive to his broadcast, so to speak. Now, in addition to this, by his, by his influence on others, Persecution is also a roar by which Satan intimidates us in the hope that we will capitulate at the prospect of suffering. And again, all we have to do is to look around us in this environment. Persecution. If you don't do this, you will suffer consequences. That is the devil stirring up that spirit of intimidation. But again, let's look at what Peter is saying here. Peter warns us that, the, that he, he wants us to be vigilant. We must be vigilant. We must remember, brethren, that the roaring lion is the crazed anger of a defeated enemy. And if we do not fear his ferocious bark, we will never be consumed by his bite. So what do we do? We must resist. We must resist. We must always, always recognize the fact that there is a war going on as to how we use our minds. There's a war going on as to how we use our minds. We are constantly under attack. That is why we are reminded to be vigilant. We must always guard our minds. And as Proverbs 4 and verse 23 reminds us, more than all that you guard, guard your mind. This is the citadel that the devil wants to penetrate over. More than all that you guard, guard your mind. The devil's tactic is to deceive his victims rather than challenge them openly. Spiritual discernment is absolutely vital. Let's notice again some scriptures here. You don't have to turn to all of them. Again, 1 Peter verse 5 and verse 9. Resist him, resist him, firm in your faith, knowing that the same kind of suffering have been experienced by your brotherhood throughout the world. And we must know, brethren, there's absolutely no way we can put up effective resistance without spiritual armor. There is no way that we can put up effective resistance without spiritual armor. Ephesians 6 and verse 13. Ephesians 6 and verse 13 states, Therefore, take on the whole armor of God. Note what it says here, the whole armor of God, that you may be able to withstand in the evil day and having done all to stand. In 2 second, second Corinthians 6 and verse 6, breaking into the thought here, this is uh, the apostle Paul writing to the church, states, in pureness, in knowledge, in long-suffering, in kindness, in the Holy Spirit, in unfeigned or genuine love. And nobody says here in verse 7, in the word of truth, in the power of God, through the weapons of righteousness. Let's understand this, brethren. If we try to fight the devil 
with weapons, carnal weapons, weapons of unrighteousness, we are dead. We are bound to fail. Paul says, the weapons of unrighteousness, sorry, the weapons of righteousness on the right hand and on the left. 2 Corinthians 10 and verse 3. 2 Corinthians 10 and verse 3. For though we walk in the flesh, we do not war according to the flesh. For the weapons of our warfare are not of the flesh, but divinely powerful for the destruction of fortress. Again, brethren, Satan wants us to fight war according to the flesh. In James 4 and verse 7, James writes, Therefore submit to God, resist the devil, and he will flee from you. So we see here then both submission to God and resistance to the devil must take place in our minds. Again, the battle is in our minds. Submission to God and resistance to the devil must take place in our minds. God is looking, brethren, God is looking for a willing and spontaneous submission from each and every one of us. Resisting Satan involves resisting the mental pressures this being puts upon us. And the best way to strengthen our minds, the best way to strengthen our minds against the devil's attack is to get on our knees and beseech God in prayer, to draw near to God. There are no shortcuts. There are no shortcuts, brethren. There is no royal road to geometry, as the saying goes. We got to hit the books. There is no royal road to geometry. There are no shortcuts. We have to understand that. Because we must know, again, as we read from Christ earlier, the simple fact is, often by ourselves, we can do nothing, plain and simple. So we resist the devil then by being fully armed with the whole armor of God and standing firm in our faith. Now what does that mean? Standing firm in our faith means that we have absolute trust in what is written. We have absolute trust in what is written. And for that, we must always remember the example of Jesus Christ, our master. When the adversary hurled at him, all the fiery dots that he could muster, Jesus says, it is written, it is written, it is written. Three times he deflected all of Satan's fiery dots. That is the reality of the situation. This is the example we must emulate. In Isaiah 50 and verse 7, you don't have to turn there. This is a prophecy about Jesus Christ. Isaiah 50 and verse 7. For the eternal God will help me. Therefore I will not be disgraced. Therefore I have set my face like flint. Do we understand that? I have set my face like flint. And I know that I will not be ashamed. Resisting the devil means we must remain firm. Steadfast in our trust to God. No matter what. Now Peter also in, in this verse, he also encourages us to keep in mind members of the body of Christ scattered throughout the world. Who face the same pressures from Satan. As he says here, the same afflictions are accomplished by your brotherhood that are in the world. So Peter wants us not to just think about ourselves, but think about the members, the body of Christ, whether they are in Australia, whether they are in Colombia, no matter where they are on the face of this earth, we may not know them personally, but we have to be mindful of these things because everyone faced the same pressures from this being. Remember that we, as we covered earlier, what, what from Job, 
this being is still going to and fro on the earth. He has not set up camp someplace, so to speak. He is still walking to and fro on the earth, seeing who he can devour. So we are not alone in fighting this, fighting this momentous battle. And the devil will do his utmost to keep us from developing the qualities that will, the qualities that are essential for us to qualify to become God's laborers. God is training us to be laborers in his great harvest, brethren. It is a difficult training, but ask yourself, how could it be otherwise? How could God's training be anything but difficult? It's ironic. It's ironic that human beings are put through difficult and demanding training for physical warfare, for the purpose of destroying life on behalf, uh, uh, at the behest of the destroyer. I mean, some of you might have been in boot camp, whatever. All the training that takes place for the purpose of what? To kill, to destroy life. On the other hand, we are in training so that we will be prepared to assist others so that they will have an opportunity to be given the gift of life as children of God. We will be tasked on behalf of the Lord of the harvest, being direct assistance to the overseer of the harvest with the incredible privilege and responsibility of helping many for the first time to know who God is. Now, to help us keep all this in perspective, the Apostle Peter reminds us of the living hope to which we have been called. We're going to read that in a little bit, but this is in 1 Peter 1. He reminds us of the living hope to which we have been begotten. We have hope in a world there is no hope. He leaves us with the confidence assurance based on the full knowledge of God as revealed in Christ. Our adversary will roar. He might roar and try to devour. But as Paul wrote to the Christians at Rome, if God be for us, who can be against us? So let's go back to 1 Peter 5 and verse 10. And let's see the instruction that Peter has here for us. 1 Peter 5 and verse 10. Peter writes, but the God of all grace. Now, Peter begins here by describing God in, a, in the most fundamental way, the most basic way of the God of all grace. God is both the possessor and the giver of grace. Now, we recall, as we covered the last time, how the testimony of the Apostle Paul concerning the churches in Macedonia, how they responded to God's grace. God's grace is not wishy-washy. God's grace, brethren, is something we can never afford to take for granted day in and day out in our lives. Its reality must permeate our whole being. Consider, we of all people on the face of this earth are the recipients of God's grace now. Our suffering may be intense at times, but never forget God's grace is stronger. Let's notice, keep your place there. Notice Ephesians chapter 2. Ephesians chapter 2 and verse 1. Ephesians 2 and verse 1. But God, sorry, Ephesians 2 and verse 1. This is the English Standard Version rendering. And you were dead in trespasses and sins, in which you once walked, following the course of this world, following the prince of the power of the air, the spirit that is now at work in the sons of disobedience, among whom we all once lived in the passions of our flesh, carrying the desires of the body and mind, and were by nature children of wrath, like the rest of mankind. But notice what it says in verse 4. 
But God, who is rich in mercy, we, brethren, are the recipients of God's mercy. Because of the great love with which he loved us. It's easy to read over those verses. Because of the great love in which he loved us, even when we were dead in our trespasses, trespasses made us alive with Christ, by grace you have or you are being saved, and raised up, and raise, and raise up with him and seated us with him in the heavenly places in Christ Jesus, so that in the coming ages he might show the immeasurable, that means the exceeding and surpassing riches of his grace. Now, the, the lower nida translate that phrase, he is gracious beyond anything we can imagine. Continuing the last part of the verse 7, in riches of his grace in kindness towards us in Christ Jesus. For by grace you are been saved through faith. And this is not of your own doing, it is the gift of God. Brethren, what an incredibly stupendous gift God has given to us at this time. And Paul brings to our attention the fact that all of Christ's grace is treasured up in Christ Jesus, to whom we have been given access to now. Now, someone once said, and it has been well said, that God in his grace gives us what we do not deserve. And in his mercy, he does not give us what we do deserve. God, in his grace, gives us what we do not deserve. And in his mercy, he does not give us what we do deserve. Now, God has given us many things. God has given us the word of his grace, as revealed in Holy Scriptures. He's given us, his Holy Spirit is the spirit of grace. You can find that in Hebrews 10 Verse 29, we're not going to turn there. And of course, in Hebrews 4, we know that God's throne is a throne of grace, where we can find grace to help in time of need. Let's just read one verse in John 1 and verse 16. John 1 and verse 16 states, From the fullness of his grace, we have all received one blessing after another. Notice what it says here, one blessing after another. Now, these are just a few examples of grace that comes from the God of all grace. Again, all treasured up in Jesus Christ. So the question we need to ask ourselves, brethren, what do we have to complain about? As the recipients of God's grace, what do we have to complain about? Let's go back in 1 Peter again. 1 Peter 5 and verse 10. Now, now Peter gives us some things we need to focus on. We need to always keep the focus on. But the God of all grace, who has called us to his eternal glory in or by Christ Jesus. God has called us to his eternal glory. What an incredible thing. Now, the, the Apostle Paul was astounded by the carnality displayed by the members of the church in Corinth. And he wondered if they really understood their calling. What, what Peter says? God has called us to his eternal glory. What did Paul write to the church in Corinth? 1 Corinthians 1, 26. You don't have to turn there. For consider your calling, brethren. The lower nighter translates that. Think about what you were, fellow believers, when God called you. Think about what you were, fellow believers, when God called you. 
Not many wise, according to the flesh, not many mighty, not many noble. Again, Peter makes a dogmatic statement that God has called us to his eternal glory by Christ Jesus. Paul writes, for the gifts and calling of God are irrevocable, irrevocable, which means that they can never be withdrawn. God is not going to withdraw his calling from us. He's not going to withdraw his gift from us. It's up to us to use what God has given us. Now, he's not going to, re he's not going to retract them, but we can squander them. We can squander very easily what God gives us. So God did not call us to an earthly, temporary glory, nor to a fleeting, transitory glory, but to a glory that knows no end from here to eternity. That's the glory that God has called us to. So brethren, we desperately need to cry out and ask God to help us to wrap our minds around the reality of what he is telling us through Peter here. God's glory is eternal. It has no beginning and he has no end. What can be compared to God's glory? God has given us eyes to see, but we must open wide our eyes and fix them on Jesus Christ. Again, we must take careful note that God has called us to his eternal glory in or by Christ. Yes, it is all by Christ, in Christ, called to the experience of identification with him in the glory of God the Father. Now, the Apostle Paul fully understood this when he claimed in Philippians 1, verse 21, the first part of that verse, for to me to live is Christ. For to me to live in Christ. Now Paul, like Peter, understood the eternal glory to which we have been called. And you can read that in 2 Corinthians 12 and verse 1. Some verses there where Paul has been given visions that he said that he was not, he could not, he couldn't speak about them. You can jot it down, we don't have time to cover all these. But notice in 1 Corinthians 12 and verse 9. 1 Corinthians 12 and verse 9. And he said to me, this is what Paul, this is what was said to Paul by Christ. My grace is sufficient for you. So the question we need to ask ourselves is, is, is God's grace sufficient for us? This is what Paul I mean, you read the, from verse 1 all the way down to verse 9, and, and he talks about this thorn in the flesh that God gave him. But God says, my grace is sufficient for you, for my strength is made perfect in weakness. Therefore, most gladly, I would rather boast in my infirmity that the power of God may rest upon me. So the question, brethren, is the vision of the eternal glory that God has called us Two, becoming more clearer to you is the vision of that eternal glory that God has called us to becoming more clearer to you. In Romans 8 and verse 29, Romans 8 and verse 29, we'll read this quickly, says, For whom he foreknew, that is, whom he knew in advance, he also predestined or determined in advance, that's Jewish New Testament, to be conformed to the image of his son, that he might be first, that he might be firstborn among many brethren. Moreover, whom he predestined, these he also called. Whom he called, these he, these he justified. The whom he justified, these he also glorified. We are glorified by God's spirit in us. But as flesh and blood human beings, that is only temporary. So we must continue to moving, to moving towards the eternal glory that God has in store for us. It's a process of training, moving forward. But there's an, but there's an essential process that we must go through. 
It's an essential process that we must go through that we're going to cover, as what Peter states now, going back to 1 Peter again, verse 5 and verse 10. 1 Peter again, verse 5 and verse 10. But the God of all grace, who has called us to his eternal glory by Christ, after you have suffered a while. Now, if we have been called to the eternal glory, then accompanying that call is a call to suffering. Accompanying that call is a call to suffering. And we can read in 1 Peter 1 and verse 6, but that suffering is only for a little while. Suffering is only for a little while. Now, think about it. A little while, a little while is a matter of perspective. Now, how can 70, 80, or even 90 years in the human, normal human lifespan be compared with a life that has no end? There is no comparison. Again, we must remember the principle in Proverbs 29 and verse 18. Proverbs 29 and verse 18, where there is no vision, the people perish. We must keep that eternal glory fixed in our minds. It is of utmost importance, brethren. And as shown by the example of Jesus Christ in Hebrews 12, you can read the first three verses there, we're not going to return there, but it says to consider Jesus Christ. We must keep our eyes fixed on Christ. Focus on what he's doing. Focus on what he's telling us. Now, the reality is we don't like to hear about suffering, much less having to suffer. We don't like to hear about that. But, but Paul is reminding us, as he reminds us in, back in Hebrews, that we must consider Christ, who suffered for a little while, we must weigh up carefully the endurance Christ when contemplating our own hardship. We must consider every aspect of what Christ went through for us. He did it, remember, for us. So Peter continues in 1 Peter chapter 5 and verse 10, but the God of all grace who had called us to his eternal glory by Christ after you have suffered a while, make you perfect, establish, strengthen, and settle you. So we see a three-step process here. Through suffering, God himself will make us perfect. God himself will make us perfect. Again, you can go back and read the example of Job. The Greek word translated perfect means to set in place to organize, to restore, to mend, to cause to be fully qualified. All those are the meanings. All of these shades of meaning means it comes on the umbrella of adapting to an end. So suffering, if, suffering if accepted in humility and trust will prepare us for what's ahead. And this can repair the weakness of our character of our nature that God wants to, us to focus on. Of course, we've all heard of the, the saying, no pain, no gain. There is some truth to that. That's what it says here. Through suffering, God will make us perfect. Also, you can jot down as a reference scripture, Luke 6 and verse 40, where it says, a disciple is not above his teacher, but everyone who is perfectly trained this is part of God's training process for us. So number one, through suffering, God himself will make us perfect. Through suffering, God himself will establish us. It, the word establish means to support, to strengthen, to make firm, to make solid as granite. This is what God desires of us. Through suffering, God will strengthen us. Now, Peter used this term for strengthen, and this is the only place it is used. And it, makes, it means to make stronger, to impart strength, to give strength to us. Think of how those three lads back in Babylon, Hananiah, 
Mishael and Azariah, otherwise known as Shadrach, meaning an Abednego. Now, I use that term because if you look at the meaning of those names in Greek, Hananiah means Yahweh is gracious. Mishael, Mishael means who is equal to God. Azariah means Yahweh has helped. So we understand better. We can see that the genuineness of these individuals' faith were made stronger. It was tested by fire. So their faith was genuine. So through suffering then, God will settle us. He'll make us perfect. He'll establish us. He'll strengthen us. And he will settle us. Now what does settle mean? Settle means grounded as on a foundation. Now, if we are founded on the rock, our spiritual house will withstand the storm. And I guarantee you, the storm is going to get more ferocious. But we not only have to be on the foundation, we have to be settled on it. We have to be grounded on it. We must be attached to the, to the foundation. So brethren, the Lord of the harvest has handpicked his laborers. He wants to work in his harvest. None of us filled out an application. None of us knew that that, that job that we even existed. We didn't know about it. So the question we must consider is that how diligent are we? How diligent are we, brethren, in nurturing the, the qualities God requires in us? God expects his laborers to be prepared, ready to work when the harvest begins, as pictured by this feast. And for our last scripture, let's, re let's read something that we heard <coughs> again yesterday. In Revelation 9, Revelation 19 and verse 7. Revelation 19 and verse 7 says, Let us be glad and rejoice and give honor to him, for the marriage of the Lamb is come, and his wife had made herself ready, or his wife had prepared herself. And to her was granted that she should be arrayed in fine linen, clean and white, for the fine linen is, is the righteousness of the saints. So brethren, I leave this question with you. The work close for the laborers in God's harvest is fine linen, dazzling white. Wouldn't you like to be arrayed like this? <laughs>